Welcome. This is Joshua with Moriel TV, live with James Jacob Prash. Understanding Millennial Sacrifices and Hebrew Holy Days in the Book of Ezekiel. Jacob? Blessings in Jesus, dear friends from California. The Book of Ezekiel is a complicated book for most believers in Jesus, most Christians. Much confusion surrounding it, and even people who broadly understand that the closing chapters of Ezekiel concern prophecies of the millennial, they have a lot of almost chaotic thinking that intimidates them concerning why the reintroduction of Levitical blood sacrifices in the temple if the blood of Christ cleansed from all sin. This is a very broad topic but we have to put it in its proper context. Let me begin with the term messianic. This term is bantered about in many ways. Unfortunately, in popular usage, colloquially, it often means the messianic movement of Jewish believers or the corrupted version of it, which is predominant, that some people can rightly call synagogues, where you have Gentiles being put under the law, imitating Jewish believers, and Jews seeking to live under two covenants, like the Neo-Galatians. I'm not saying all of the modern Messianic movement is like that, but much of it is. Much of it is simply Yiddishkeit married to Charismania. Uh, they're lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness, or Yeshuaness, and putting people, Jew and Gentile, under the law. The Messianic movement is a mess. Now, it's not all like that. There are good Messianic congregations, good Messianic fellowships, but they are in the minority. Probably only 25 to 35% are sane. The other two-thirds are fringe. But we're not talking about Messianic in that sense. We're talking about messianic as a theological term. That being of or about or pertaining to the Messiah. Of or pertaining to the Messiah in some way. Messianic. We have to understand there is a messianic theme in Ezekiel. There is messianic prophecy in Ezekiel and messianic typology in Ezekiel. Now, whenever you come to a book of the Bible, any book, but particularly a complicated one in the thinking of most people, such as the book of Ezekiel, we can think of it as a one or 2,000 piece crossword puzzle. Only you don't really understand the entire picture. There's no photo on the box. You've just had it described to you. How do you approach such a puzzle? Where do you begin? Well, people who do these puzzles will normally, in, from their experience, begin with the pieces of the puzzle that have a straight edge, that have a straight 180 degree edge. They will also look for anything that has a right angle, a 90 degree angle and put those in the corners. They know that the pieces that have an edge generally go together and form the outer periphery of the puzzle. So they begin there. They construct a framework. Approaching a book of God's word, in this case Ezekiel, is much the same. You look for the most simple pieces to figure out where they belong. Find the cornerstone pieces. Find the straight edge pieces and make a frame. And within that framework, we begin to assemble the other pieces of the puzzle. It makes it much easier once we have established the correct framework. My wife is a math teacher. And what my wife will tell students is... Do not be intimidated by a quadratic equation or a second order differential equation. Begin with the things that are basic. Begin with the factors 
that you know are the things you can factor and how they associate or integrate with each other. Once you get these basics, the rest of the equation is much more decipherable, approachable, solvable. Same idea, same concept. Well, let's begin with Ezekiel. We always begin with the Sitzumleben, the cultural and historical setting of the prophet himself. Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah are sometimes called the brothers, the brothers, even in Judaism, the brothers. They were broadly contemporary. Daniel a little bit towards the end, but all broadly contemporary. The brothers. We have no scriptural record of them having known each other. Perhaps they did, perhaps they didn't. But they were certainly familiar with each other's prophecies. They were certainly familiar with each other's prophecies going towards the approach of the Babylonian captivity in 585 BC. Jeremiah continues after Ezekiel. Daniel continues after Ezekiel and Babylon itself. The last prophecy we have of Ezekiel is probably April of 570 BC before Christ or before the common era. He prophesied over a period of about 22 years, broadly contemporary with Jeremiah and overlapping somewhat with Daniel. The 10 northern tribes have already gone into the Assyrian captivity in 721. They're approaching the tumultuous events of Nebuchadnezzar's invasions and the destruction of the first temple and the Babylonian captivity. That was his own time. Before we can understand any future prophetic meaning, we must understand his own time, the cultural and historical setting, the life situation, the Sitzemleben. That's the first step always. We must also remember, again, the absolute maxim that all of Israel's prophets prophesied for three time frames, sometimes all in the same verse, almost the same breath, but certainly frequently in the same passage. They prophesied for their own time, they prophesied for the first coming of the Messiah, and they prophesied for the second coming of the Messiah. And some of these prophecies were even compound. It could have been for their own time and for the first coming, or for the first coming and the second. Not always easy to work out, but something we need to be aware of. They're prophesying for three different time frames, almost concurrently. The third thing we have to understand is this. All of Israel's prophets, all of them, foreshadow or typify the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, in some way. All of them. No exceptions. How does Ezekiel typify the Messiah? Only two people in Scripture are called the Son of Man. Jesus and Ezekiel. Now, walking in the oven with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there was a Christophany. Daniel saw one as the Son of Man. That was Jesus. But Ezekiel is actually called Son of Man. He's addressed that way by God himself. Remember, in eternity, Jesus is Son of God. But coming to earth, he's Son of Man. There is something about Ezekiel's ministry that teaches about the ministry of Jesus on earth as the Son of Man. In chapters 2 and 3, we see that he is popularly rejected. He knew ahead of time most of the people would not receive his message. But God told him to preach it anyway. This is much like the Lord Jesus. He knew as Messiah he would be popularly rejected. Only a faithful remnant of people would believe him and accept his message. Secondly, Ezekiel prophesied for the destruction of the temple. 
the judgment of God on the temple that was going to come because of the idolatry in it in chapters 8 and 9. Now, Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9 are crucial in understanding the book of Revelation, those who were sealed with the mark of the Lamb. I only mention that in passing, but Ezekiel is one of the more important books in understanding the book of Revelation as a background. So he's a type of Christ. He's a type of the Lord Jesus. He knew he was going to be rejected. He's called the Son of Man, and he foresees the destruction of Jerusalem and its ramifications. He saw the temple defiled, as Jesus did, twice with the money changers. In all of these aspects and more, Ezekiel foreshadows the Lord Jesus. Something else happens. After the temple itself is destroyed, and after these terrible events of Nebuchadnezzar coming take place, the prophecies of Ezekiel become more relevant. After the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the prophecies of Jesus became more relevant. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive, Jesus said in John 6. When Simon bar Kokhba, a major type or shadow of the Antichrist, came, Rabbi Akiva pronounced him to be the Messiah. So even after the judgment predicted by Jesus came, the people persisted in following that which proved to be false. This is very similar to what happens in the experience and time of what Ezekiel predicted. The people would still go after false leaders, false prophets, false teachers who will mislead them, but they would reject the one who told the truth. They reject the Son of Man. They rejected Ezekiel, and so they reject Jesus, the Son of Man. So we had Sitzenraben, and we need to understand all the prophets prophesied for three time frames. We need to understand all the prophets typify the Lord Jesus. Additionally, as always, we need to understand what is Judaic, that is Judeo-centric, and what is both Judeo-centric and ecclesiological. That is to say, what is specifically for Israel and the Jews alone, and what is for Israel and the Jews that also applies or has meaning for the church. There are things in Scripture that are Judeo-centric. They have a specific meaning for Israel and the Jews, and the book of Ezekiel contains a number of such instances. But there are other instances that speak to Israel and the Jews and to the church additionally. We can have things that are Judeo-centric that do not have heavy application or meaning for the church. But there is nothing that only applies to the church in the Old Testament and not to Israel and the Jews. Replacement theology of any form is to be rejected. You can say, in addition to Israel, it has meaning or application to the church, but not instead of. Bearing in mind, there are things there only for Israel. And this is, again, true in Ezekiel. So we put all of these things together by way of background. That he's a type of the Messiah. That we need to look at the Sitzim Leben, the period in which he prophesied, broadly contemporary with Daniel and Jeremiah, before the destruction of the first temple. Circa 570 BC, he's prophesying about 15 years before the temple would finally be destroyed. Additionally, we have to understand that the messianic theme is typological. He's a type of Christ, like all of Israel's prophets. His message, like all the prophets, is one of repentance, but in his case, it's one of repentance in an age of desperation. As things got worse, the people only 
withdrew further from the truth. Well, the last days will be the same. As things worsen, people who should know better will draw further from the truth, both Israel and the church. Now that is, broadly speaking, the background. For his own time, it's clear the judgment of God is coming. Here he concurs with Daniel and Jeremiah. But he prophesies for the first coming of the Messiah. For instance, in, Dan, in Ezekiel chapter 45, he gives a prophecy that has a future meaning for the millennium, but also a meaning for the first coming of the Messiah. The Lord will enter through the East Gate, as we saw on Palm Sunday in the triumphal entry narrative. And the East Gate would then be sealed up after the Messiah comes. Well, we look at this uh, in Ezekiel chapter 44, the gate for the prince. He brought me back by the way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces the east, and it was shut. And the Lord said, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. For the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. Now, again, this has a future meaning for the millennium, but it has a meaning for the first coming of Jesus. It points to the deity of Christ. He, as the Messiah, was God who became a man, fully human and fully divine. He would have entered through the Shad Harakamim, the Golden Gate, the East Gate, on Palm Sunday. A Turkish sultan, knowing that Christians believed the Messiah would go through that gate, but being a follower of Muhammad, sealed it, sealed it up. Suleiman the Magnificent had it completely cemented. Today, the East Gate is on the same location it's always been. We know this from the Herodian stones that are foundational, discovered by Dr. James Fleming. It's on the same location as it always was. Today, the inside of the gate, its chamber, is an Islamic library. But the gate itself, it's not just shut, it's cemented up. You can't get in, and there's an Islamic cemetery in front of it. They put the graves there on purpose, because they know that Jews could not come into contact with the dead, even indirectly, not even go through a boneyard or cemetery. Otherwise, they would be ritually defiled, and unable to worship in the temple. That is why the Muslims did what they did in the Turkish occupation. However, they had no idea they were fulfilling the prophecies of Ezekiel 44. Again, it has a future prophetic meaning for the millennium, but it has a meaning for the first coming of Christ. We're always looking at three stages. The Sitzerleben, the prophet's own time, the first coming, and the second. Well, let's go further with this now. With this background, we have a framework. The Sitzim Laban, Ezekiel as a type of the Messiah, the theme, which is repentance in a time of desperation and impending judgment, and we have the usual ingredients of looking at the fact that he prophesies for three time frames. So our question today becomes the festal and the Levitical. Why are these feasts that are celebrated in the millennium celebrated and the others not? And why are there blood sacrifices in the millennium? Well, let's begin with the feasts. When we take the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, Zotasu lezikroni, do this in remembrance of me. It is a memorial, but Paul tells us we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is a Paschal celebration. The Last Supper was a Passover Seder. When you have a Paschal observance, there's always a looking back and a looking forward. Jews, unsaved Jews, look back to the redemption from Egypt, 
look forward to the coming redemption of the Messiah. We as believers in Jesus, when we take the Lord's Supper, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we, we look back and we look forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we proclaim his death. We look back to the cross until he comes. The Lord's Supper is not only a memorial of what he did do, it is an appetizer, a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb, a testimony of what he shall do. This is why Jesus said at the Last Supper, I long to do this, but I say to you, I shall not do it again until I do it in the kingdom of my Father. In the Messianic kingdom, the Lord's Supper will be taken again as the marriage supper of the Lamb that we read about in the book of Revelation, chapters 19 and 20, and in uh, the Song of Solomon. It is the wedding feast. Well, let's look at this more carefully. Jewish weddings had three phases. We talk about this on our teaching on the parable of the wedding. You had consecration, convocation, and consummation. Consecration is the setting apart by God. It is the legal contractual phase of the Jewish wedding in biblical times and in the time of Jesus, the background of Matthew 25. Betrothal or engagement was legally binding. You were contractually married. The bridegroom had to come back for the bride by covenant. He had to do it. She didn't know the day or the hour. She only knew by the signs of the times, the changing seasons. As it got into spring, she knew the time was drawing. So the Song of Solomon, she's reciting this poetry and she's composing songs based on the changing seasons, the winter being over, things blossoming and so forth and flora and uh, different kinds of vegetation and fruit. And these were signs that her lover was going to be coming. Now, again, we have extended teachings on this on other recordings, but realize that consecration was the first step. Jesus became consecrated, engaged to the church, and the church became consecrated to him, his betrothed in the first coming. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. He must come back by covenant agreement. He's contractually obligated. You couldn't get out of a betrothal. That's why Joseph would have had to give a rid of divorce to Mary uh, before the formal wedding took place. You were already legally married. Now, there are some countries that still do this. You go to a registry office and sign a registry, and you have a civil proceeding, which is for legal purposes, and then people go to a church or something for a religious ceremony. Well, it's the same thing, only there was a period of about a year in between the two. So you have consecration, betrothal, engagement. That's the first coming. In the millennium, however, we have the second coming. It uses marital language. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, we see that there will be the nuptial, that is, the convocation on front of the witnesses for the marriage of the Lamb. Think of the millennium as a wedding celebration that goes on for a thousand years. That is one aspect of it. Now, there are other aspects as well. The original plan God had for man, what would have happened if Adam and Eve had not sinned, what would the earth have been like, what would have happened if Israel accepted the Messiah. There are multiple other aspects of what the millennium will be and will involve. But one is an ongoing wedding feast. We see in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, it uses the language of the wedding. The bridegroom was going to come. It was given to her to clothe herself in the linen, bright and clean for the fine linens or the righteous deeds of the saints in Revelation 
chapter 19, verse 8. Verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. Well, what do we have in the Song of Solomon? I will rejoice in you and be glad. I will extol your love more than wine. I know I sing terribly, but this hymn comes from the Song of Solomon. And you see it in the book of Revelation. Let no one tell you that the Song of Solomon is not a typological prefiguring of the marriage of the Lamb, of Jesus to the church. And it also has ramifications for God's relationship with Israel as Israel's Baal or husband. Let us rejoice and be glad, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has been made ready. Now this goes on, and the bride is ready, like in the Song of Solomon, adorned for her husband. But in chapter 20, we see what happens. Once Satan has been bound, once the false prophet and antichrist have been dealt with, we see the millennial reign of Christ in chapter 20. One important aspect of the millennium, it is a thousand-year-old wedding banquet. It is the convocation of the saints. In his first coming, we have the consecration, the betrothal, the engagement. In his second coming, we have the nuptial, the convocation, the witnesses to the romance who are the hosts of heaven, the angelic choirs singing, what we call in Hebrew, Hatzavaot HaShemaim, as we see in the Song of Solomon, where the witnesses chant the refrains. In the Song of Solomon, we know what the bride is singing by the gender. We know what the bridegroom sings back to her by the gender. But by the number, by the plural, we see that Sevaot HaShemaim, the hosts of heaven, witnessing the relationship and singing the refrain and the choruses. This is the background to the book of Revelation and also in part to Matthew 25. Again, a related but separate subject, much more depth to it than I had appropriate means to explain at the moment. We refer you to our other teaching. But notice you have the marriage, the wedding, the nuptial in the millennium. However, after that, in chapter 22, we have the third phase, the third phase where the bride comes down out of heaven, adorned for her husband in chapters 21 and chapter 22. We see chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 2, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. That will be consummation. You consummate the marriage. Now, again, it is a corporate bride, not an individual one. Be careful of the paganistic concepts of Jesus being a personal lover. This is completely pagan and alien to what the scriptures teach. It comes from the Greek thought where Zeus, the Greek god who they associated with the planet Jupiter, at least the Romans would later call Zeus Jupiter, was on Mount Olympus instead of dwelling on Mount Zion. And he has relations with a human woman producing a savior, Hercules, who's half human and half divine. Now notice how this counterfeits what happens with the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus is not half human and half divine. He's fully human and fully divine. He's not in the character of Hercules and he enters Mount Zion, where he will reign in the millennium, okay? This pagan idea, however, was one where God would have relations with the human woman. Now, we see this in Mormonism, and we see it not only in Greek mythology, but we see it in Roman Catholicism, where Roman Catholic nuns called Jesus, their betrothed, their brides of Christ, when they take their final vows, it's a kind of wedding ceremony. Nuns in the Middle Ages would read the Song of Solomon as erotic literature. That was their Fifty Shades of Grey, whatever this crazy stuff is today that I've, I've read about that women, some women are reading. Well, that was, they, they used it as erotic literature. 
uh, fantasizing about relations with Jesus. This is completely perverted and completely pagan. The whole idea of nuns and convents is perverted. It was copied from Buddhist monasteries and Buddhist nuns uh, when Buddhists reached Alexandria uh, in the 4th, 5th century and beyond. These ideas were planted, and that's how it evolved, but it's not anything found in Scripture. These are the three wedding narratives of Matthew chapter 25, the second half of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew's version, then the millennium in Revelation chapters 19 and 20, and then the third wedding narrative being Revelation chapter 21 leading into chapter 22. We have the consecration, the betrothal, the convocation, the nuptial itself, which is the millennium, and we have again the consummation we shall be as he is this oneness that takes place this oneness now again you have counterfeits of this in mystical buddhism and in hinduism with such teachings as nirvana there's always a pagan counterfeit of it you have counterfeits of it in kabbalah in mystical judaism and the zohar we only look at what's scriptural all the rest are demonic counterfeits so we understand now that the marriage supper of the Lamb will be the other dimension of the Paschal celebration of the Seder meal. The Seder looks back and looks forward. Passover looks back and looks forward. We proclaim his death until he comes. It is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb not just a memorial of what he did for us on the cross and in his resurrection. We look back to the betrothal. Behold, I go and prepare a, prepare a place for you. Where I am, you may be also. But then he's coming again for his bride. So we have the Passover in the millennium because it is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember the apostles asking Jesus, can I sit at your right hand or your left? The most honored guests invited to a Passover Seder at the triclinium table. Again, it does not look anything like uh, Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, The Last Supper. It didn't look like that. It's, it was very different. It was on cushions on low triclinium, a three-sided table. But who's going to be on my left? Who's going to be on my right reclining with me? This was the thinking of the apostles. They had a sense that there was a future meaning to this. Jesus obviously taught them about this to some degree. We see it in the Gospels. We certainly see it in the book of Revelation. And we understand, again, in light of its Sitzimleben, the Jewish culture of the Second Temple period in which Jesus came and ministered, died, and rose, and in which the Holy Spirit was poured out. So, that is why we have Passover in the millennium. We also have another feast, the Feast of Booths, Hag Sukkot. There was a partial fulfillment of Hag Sukkot in his first coming also in John chapter 7, where he spoke of the living water. But in Ezekiel 47, we see the ultimate fulfillment of Hag Sukkot, of the living water. The celebration known in Judaism and in the time of Jesus as Simcha Bet Shoiva. This is what was taking place in John chapter 7. We know from Zechariah chapter 14 that the millennium is a picture of the messianic reign. It was a memorial to the Jews of God's provision for them in the wilderness. It looked back but it also looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. As we've pointed out in various of our teachings, this is why at the Transfiguration, Peter wanted to build three booths for Jesus, Yeshua, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, and Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah. He thought that was the commencement of the millennium. Here's the Messiah, here's Moses, here's Elijah, should they build the booths? Now again, we have other teachings explaining this in considerable depth, I only mention it in passing relative to our subject today. So, we know from Zechariah 14, the meaning of the millennium is 
represented in the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles and in the Simcha Beta Shoiva, the living water flowing. This is Ezekiel 47, but Ezekiel 47 has its New Testament parody in John chapter 7. The living water, behold, I give you living water, the Simcha Bet Shoiva. So we have Passover and we have the Feast of Tabernacles. We do not have the others anymore. We do not have the Feast of First Fruit, Hag Matzot, per se. We do not have the Day of Pentecost, uh, Hag Shavuot. We do not have Yom Kippur. We do not have Rosh Hashanah, as it's now called. Originally, Yom Truah, the Feast of Trumpets. We don't have any of that. Those things have been totally fulfilled by the time of the millennium. It is only tabernacles and Passover that are being fulfilled in their totality in the millennium, even though they had partial fulfillments in the first coming of Christ. Well, let's understand this even further. Although the holy days are different, there's only two in the millennium, only two, the sacrifices are the same as what we see in the book of Leviticus. If you read Leviticus chapters 23 and 24, the sacrifices are the same for the millennial celebrations as they were in the Old Testament. This is important, but that is the reason why we only have those two holy days. The others have been totally fulfilled. Let's move on to the second half of the question. Why the sacrifices if the blood of Christ has taken away all sin? As we've explained various times in different teachings, there'll be two kinds of people in the millennium. There will be us, and we will have bodies similar or the same as the resurrected body of Jesus. After he rose from the dead, the way he appeared to the apostles. It was the same body. He had the marks in his wrist, the radius and so forth. It was him, but he looked different and he had supernatural powers. He could tr tr translocate instantly. He could be translated from one place to another, walk through walls, etc. We will have supernatural bodies like Christ did in the millennium. But there'll be another kind of people in the millennium. The kind of people in the millennium will be those who are the descendants of the survivors of the last seven years of history, both Jews and Gentiles. They will be like we are now, with the exception of the fact that they will have the longevity of antediluvian man. They will live to the ages of Methuselah, which is nearly a thousand years. It is an incredible thing, but Methuselah, Methuselah, a death shall come when he is sent, or death shall be sent when he goes, lived nearly one-sixth of all human history. Just think of it. One-sixth of all human history since Adam. There was a man who lived through it, through a sixth of it. Now, that's remarkable. That's absolutely remarkable. Uh, when I was a little boy, there was a very old lady whose grandmother, as a very old lady, remembered Napoleon. That was a big deal. I remember watching, you can still watch it on YouTube, a clip of the early days of television, a black and white program called I've Got a Secret. And there was a very old gentleman, this was before I was born, it was about 1950 or so, and he was the last living witness to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He was taken to the Ford Theater by an uncle or a grandfather at the age of five, and he witnessed the assassination of Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth. Well, things like that impress us, certainly impress me, that there's people who can remember such things. But that's nothing like Methuselah, and it's nothing like what will be in the millennium. Again, we are told that if someone dies at the age of 120, it'll be considered a pediatric fatality. Nonetheless, we deal with these subjects of the millennium on other teachings. What we want to say is this. Those people will not have the same concept of sin that we have. This is not to say they will not have a fallen nature. They will. 
And it's not to say they'll have to make a decision for Christ. At the end of the thousand years, they will. What it is to say is, a little baby crawling on the rug has no concept of sin. If a baby is crying because of teething, well, that's reasonable. But if a baby cries because it wants attention, that's the fallen nature. Now, the baby has no sense it's the fallen nature, but it's the fallen nature. He's not, or she's not crying because they're hungry or because they're teething. They just want attention. Well, we pick them up and love them just the same uh, as if they were teething because we love them and they, they need attention. But there's a difference. They want what they want. You tell the baby they can't have something, they cry. They don't realize their desire to put their finger in the electrical socket when their parents tell them not to. They don't see it as sin. They don't have the concept of sin. Now, it is evidence of the fallen nature, but they don't know it. We don't have to teach children how to lie. We have to teach them how to tell the truth, as my friend David Pawson points out. Babies don't have the same concept of sin as they develop as they get older. People in the millennium will be like that. The world, the flesh, and the devil. There will not be the world, the cosmos, the fallen world. There will only be the earth as God intended it to be if Adam had not fallen. The devil, he'll be bound. It will only be the flesh. How do we deal with it? These people have no concept now. The same as the Old Testament sacrifices were types, pictures of what the Messiah would do. We're talking about the Paschal Lamb. In the millennium, there'll be types of what he did do, a way to preach the gospel to people who do not have the same concept of sin. Now, there are those who have argued that the word memorial or the word remembrance do not occur in the closing chapters of Ezekiel from chapter 41 onwards, that they're never called a memorial offering. Well, first of all, some people who only read English, obviously, there was one website that was rather pathetic. It was a hyper-Messianic one. They said this, the, the, this book of Ezekiel doesn't say memorial. It says remembrance, but not in those chapters. These things all come from the Hebrew word or the Hebrew infinitive, liskor, to recollect, to remember. Zikaron, memorial. <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh when you have a commemoration, a memorial commemoration of somebody who died at the date of their death or burial, um, again, it, it comes from the same word. The memorial of a death or burial in Hebrew, haskera, haskera, again, from the score, memory, zikaron, haskera, les kir. You know, you have uh, a memorial ceremony that is a memorial. But it all comes from zikaron, zikaron, uh, liskor, to remember. Again, do this in remembrance of me. Zotasu le zikroni. That silly website did not know that the term for remembrance and the term for memorial is essentially the same in Hebrew. With only slight variations, all of these things are the same word in Hebrew. Same root, same shortish, same meaning. Uh, let's look at this closer now. There are two aspects of the atonement. Most people do not really grasp it. Some people have a completely wrong idea. The body and the blood. When Jesus celebrated the Passover, he took the matzah, which represented his body, and the wine, which represented his blood. The matzah, according to John 6, and even according to the Jewish Mishnah and Talmud, had to be striped and pierced. By his stripes we are healed, he was pierced for our transgression, and it corresponds to the flesh of the Paschal Lamb, and had to be striped and pierced to celebrate the Paschal Seder. Okay, This is my body, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Remember, it is a memorial in John 6. The flesh profits nothing. The Roman Catholic concept of the Mass, that he dies repeatedly, is directly contrary to 1 Peter chapter 3 and to no fewer than six passages in the Epistle to the Hebrews, he dies once and for all as a perfect sacrifice, perfecting for all time those who are being saved. It is a memorial. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Well, let's understand this further. The body and the blood. The life is in the blood. You have the korbanic aspect, and you have the kaporic aspect. The korban comes from the Hebrew word, the sacrifice, leakriv, leakriv. That is the destruction of the body. But then you have the kaporic, as in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that which covers the blood of the goat that was chosen to be for the Lord would cover the sin of the people until the Messiah came and removed it. We had to invent the word in English to convey this idea. This word was invented by William Tyndale, atonement, meaning at one moment, we can be reconciled to God through the blood. But to get the blood, the body had to die. In Roman Catholicism, normally, they only eat the bread. They look to the death of his body. Only the priest drinks the wine, the blood. This is completely unscriptural. The blood and the body are not the same. One is the korbanic, one is the kaporic. One is the messianic fulfillment of Passover, the other is the partial messianic fulfillment of Yom Kippur. The lamb dies, but why is blood never mentioned in the Passion Narratives? We explain this on another one of our tapes. We know there had to be bleeding with the Roman flogging and with the crown of thorns and with the nailing to the cross, but there is no specific mention of blood until Jesus is dead in John 19. We know that the Roman centurion is standing there and one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and immediately blood and water came out. We know from cadavers that were execu uh, executed or that were crucified Roman style, they were kept alive on artificial life support systems, uh, cardio uh, pulmonary systems artificially, but crucified Roman style and then autopsies were performed on them in France when the Turin Shroud was investigated for the first time. And it was determined that what would have killed Jesus was primarily pericardial infusion. And you would have had a buildup of water and blood tissue in the thorax extending downwardly. So it made perfect sense when he was stabbed, you would have had this blood gushing forth with water, the flesh and the spirit. Only then do you see blood. You don't see blood anywhere in the passion narrative from Gethsemane where he sweats water, perspiration, and blood until he's dead. In Gethsemane, he takes our sin, atones for our sin on the cross in the sense that he paid the price for it. But in Gethsemane, when God is putting our sin on Jesus to give us his righteousness, you see that there's perspiration and he's perspiring blood together with the water. Only after he's deceased do you see the blood and the water together. When this happens, we're told in Matthew's Gospel, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 27, at the same time, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two, top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks 
shaked and there was a kind of resurrection. This is a partial fulfillment of Yom Kippur that we read about in the book of Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 9. When Jesus was on the cross, he was our high priest making atonement for our sin. But he took his blood to make atonement. He was not simply dying for our sin. That was the death of his body. This is my body. The life is in the blood. The corpse had to be dead before the blood could be applied. When the Levitical priests brought the sacrifices, they had to kill the goat before the blood could be applied. And the Passover, they had to kill the lamb in Egypt before the blood could be applied to the doorposts and the lentils in the form of a bloodied cross. The death of the body must take place before the blood can be applied. It's the blood. Life is in the blood. Two phases of atonement. First is the korbanic, the sacrifice itself, which is the death of the body. That is the paschal, to do with Passover, the slaughtering of the lamb. The second in the New Testament is, as it were, taking the blood of the lamb. Now, Passover could be celebrated, according to Leviticus, with either a goat or a lamb, and there's a reason for that. You could also use a goat, because both the goat and, and the lamb are types of Christ. Again, a related but separate subject. The blood could only be applied once the body was dead. Then the priest could apply it. Jesus takes our sin in Gethsemane, Gatshemone, the olive press garden. That's where he takes our sin. But he atones for it, of course, at Golgotha, Golgotha, the place of the skull. He atones for our sin by taking it upon himself in Gethsemane and then paying for it in Golgotha. But after he's dead, then he makes atonement by applying his blood in the temple in heaven, which is represented by its earthly model of the high priest entering the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. That's why we take the Lord's Supper with bread and wine. Contrary to the false teaching of John MacArthur that equates the blood with the death of Jesus, that's not what the scripture teaches. The death is the paschal element to do with the body. The blood is the Yom Kippur element to do with the blood. One is the korbanic, the other is the kaporic. They are different. One must take place before the other, before the blood could be applied. The priest had to sacrifice the animal, then apply its blood. No blood is mentioned in the passion narrative once Jesus is arrested until he's dead. Then comes the blood. At that point, our high priest entered the Holy of Holies. Man was no longer separated from God because of sin. We have atonement at one minute. One does not equal the other. We're saved by the body and the blood. But not in the sense that John MacArthur equates them. Not in the sense that John MacArthur equates them. John MacArthur, of course, has a Reformation definition of the gospel, not an apostolic one. It's sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide. It's right in what it says, but it's wrong in what it omits. The reformers were right in what they said. There's nothing wrong with saying sola scriptura, it's correct. Sola gratia, only by grace, it's correct. Sola fide, only by faith. It's, that's all correct. It's what they don't say that was the mistake. Always think of the Reformation as the Church of Sardis. I've not found your deeds complete. They put us on the right road, but they didn't travel far enough down it. John MacArthur parked the car on the right road, but never continued on it. He has a Reformation theology, not an apostolic one. 
he's locked in this thing with the blood and the body. It's the same. It's not. There's the Kaporic and there is the Quabonic. There's the Paschal and there's the Yom Kippur. They're both necessary and necessary in that sequence. So let me explain this now. Why do we have this in the millennium? Why do we have blood sacrifices? If it's a memorial, why does the term zikaron not appear in Ezekiel 41 through 48, where these millennial blood sacrifices are described? Why is it not there? If it's true, why is it not there? Now, Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, he was from a priestly family. He would have been well familiar with the importance of these rituals and how they were celebrated. My friend, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, makes an interesting proposition that I personally agree with. I think he's right. He says that the blood of these animals during the millennium are not salvific. They're memorials that point back to the cross. They are simply ritualistic, ritualistic or ceremonial atonement that's not salvific, doesn't give salvation. We're not saved by the blood of these animals, but he confirms it's a memorial, but he says it's necessary as a ritualistic uh, atonement. Uh, to continue with the worship of God in the millennium. I think he is correct. He does point back to the cross, and he says we're not saved by the blood of these animals. He's absolutely right, but it is a ritual necessity to have atonement in the millennium. Even though it's not what saves us, it looks back to the cross. But if it does, why is the term zikaron not there? Now, I'm not talking about the silly website that says, it says remembrance, it doesn't say memorial, they're the same, okay? Zikaron and memorial is the same, essentially, from this quarter. Well, if we read what the scriptures tell us about memorial offerings in Leviticus, beginning with Leviticus chapter 2, and also in the book of Numbers, where the teaching on memorial offerings are found, we find the following. Memorial offerings are never blood sacrifices. They are always grain. They're always bread, grain, the portion for the priests. Hence, Jesus said, this is my body. And he didn't take the flesh of the lamb. He took the matzah that represented the flesh of the lamb. Do this in remembrance of me, but it's grain. The reason we have no mention in the blood sacrifices in the temple in the millennium in the book of Ezekiel of memorial is because it's the blood sacrifices he's describing. It's the blood sacrifices he is describing. It is not the grain offerings. The grain offerings, all memorial offerings are of grain. That's not what Ezekiel is talking about. It is an obvious, simple, straightforward reason why the term memorial does not occur in Ezekiel. He's talking about blood sacrifices, not about grain offerings. But they look back to the cross. They're a way to teach the gospel during the millennium. So that is the reason we have the blood sacrifices. That is the reason why the term memorial does not occur in Ezekiel, even though they do look back to the cross. And that is the reason why in the millennium we will be celebrating Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. Pesach and Hag uh, Sukkot. I hope this clarifies matters. It's a complicated issue, step by step. Now, again, my wife is a math teacher. 
The idea of a math teacher is to make other people understand what they do. That's the purpose of any teacher. Okay. Some Christians have this idea, well, Ezekiel is complicated. I will leave that to theologians and Bible expositors. I'll let them deal with it. I'm not that. No, no, no. The purpose of theologians and Bible expositors is to make you, the ordinary Christian, understand it. It's not something to be left to experts. It's something the experts make comprehensible to you. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. With Moriel Ministries, moriel.org, please visit us online. God bless and thank you so much.